Let's review a little bit to get our mind uh, back to where we were, get off of our buses on Sunday, or if you were candy selling last week, or uh, out of shampoo in the basement, <laughs> back to American history. So, uh, The last main section we started, I've got it labeled Prelude to the War for Independence, and my goal is to get right up to the Declaration of Independence. That's where I want to get to for the test. We will, at the class period after the test, actually talk about that thing being passed by the Continental Congress and read some parts of it. Uh, but get right up to that is what I'd like to do. So prelude to the War for Independence, we talked about George III, talked about Lord Grenville. Uh, what position was he in? Yes? Prime Minister. Okay, his Prime Minister came in in 63, and he put together a package of laws and things. They had to go through Parliament and everything. He just wasn't a dictator. Um, put together this package of laws addressing the colonies. Can somebody pick out one? that um, was especially egregious. Um, that the Sugar Act of okay, the Sugar Act, that was one. Why was it especially a problem? It was the first tax directed Yeah, the first tax just for revenue, just for a tax. Uh, the Stamp Act was also that, but it had another, uh, actually kind of two other things that made it especially painful. Stephanie? Okay, no jury trial, and then this one is much more personally felt by them. Okay, we looked at the, the way the colonists responded to this, not a whole lot of, uh, they didn't like it. Uh, looked at some details, even some in Parliament people not liking this. So, All right, then we get to Charles Townsend. He comes along in 67. He's the next guy that uh, rises to the front here uh, to handle the colonists. He is the Chancellor of the Exchequer in charge of the finances. And uh, he does two main things, suspends the, the legislature of New York, and then the Revenue Act. He very incorrectly um, speculated about why the colonists were upset with the sugar tax, or more upset about the Stamp Act than the sugar tax and some of the other taxes. What was that incorrect um, reasoning? Uh, let's see, anybody else? He comes with a whole wave of taxes on things that he thought wouldn't be a problem based upon this reason. He reads the whole situation incorrectly. Um, if only had a brain. Come on. <laughs> Nobody else? If I'd only written something down last class period. <laughs> Tell you what, you can grab your neighbor's notes and read them. That way you're not embarrassed by having the wrong note. You can, you can embarrass them. <laughs> Anybody else know? You look like you want to answer. No? Okay, that was this thought of, I, I know this, but I don't want to embarrass myself. So, By being wrong, you know, he's not sure. So. All right, go ahead. There were external taxes, not internal taxes. Yeah, he thought the Congress were upset about internal taxes, taxes like the Stamp Act, where they had to personally pay it, not upset about external taxes, the tax on goods being brought into the country, import taxes. So that's why he comes up with a whole wave of import taxes. I didn't give you a whole list of things, but there's, there's about a half a dozen things here that he taxes as they come into the colonies. He thought this, this won't be a problem because they're only upset about the internal taxes. He's wrong, all right, um, but that was his thinking. All right, uh, so we have the, the import tax as part of the Revenue Act. There were two other pieces of that that are also problems in and of themselves. Uh, well, what were the other two pieces? Gregory? He set up a new court um, system to try actually skipping the taxes. Okay, so the new court system, which instantly brings up questions of unfairness. You know, they're going to side with, with the king and England. Why not use the existing courts? That, that, that instantly comes up in very legitimate questions that is... Uh, often what uh, dictators will do, you know, um, the Soviets used to claim that they always had fair trials before they executed people, you know. They would have some sort of trial, but it wasn't fair, right? So that's what they were claiming. Now, that was the fear, the legitimate fear. Okay, the other one. Morgan. The writs of assistance was very open in the search warrants. All right, so uh, the Revenue Act is passed by him, and then we see the colonies respond to this. Letters, uh, the official criticism, John Dickinson, the boycotting, et cetera. Uh, and by this point, the tensions are really building, and we see, at least as an example or a symbolic picture of that, the Boston Massacre, 
which the colonists intentionally use to inflame emotions even more. It's, it's really easy for us to look back and think that these guys always sat around with their, their hats on and their, their collars all the way up and just formally discussing politics with no emotion. Okay. They, they got hot under the collar, literally and figuratively, just like we did. And here with this shooting, that was u intentionally used uh, to, to, to generate support and sympathy for the colonists. So, all right, and then we see these getting repealed, except for a symbolic tax on the T in 1770. Then we hit this time of relative calm, 70 to 73. Not that nothing happened, but there weren't any Boston massacres. There weren't waves of new legislation. Relative calm there. And we looked at three different things that happened of note. And that gets us to uh, the new material for the day, the tea tax of 1773. I hope I didn't get overly ambitious with how much we can cover today. I did reorganize my notes a little bit, so I gotta replace them. T tax of 1773. All right, there's some things going on in the background here uh, that um, explain a little bit of how this T tax came about. All right, uh, England at this point was trying to rule India, and they were doing that with the East India Company. Now, this is, uh, it's kind of strange to us to think about this, but imagine. Um, if um, after we finished in Iraq, uh, Bush had gone to Halliburton, we always hear about how bad Halliburton was, and said, all right, I want you to take over completely governing the country. And they, 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 ran, they picked the governors, they picked the laws, they, they handled everything, a private company. Okay, what's that? Built their own armies. Built their own armies, everything. I mean, it was, that's what this East India Company was. Right? It was a private entity that the, the government of England gave the authority and responsibility of trying to rule India. All right? And they had their own armies. There's some, actually some famous battles that these armies fight in. Um, that company, the East India Company, was going bankrupt. So England here is in a pickle. We, we, they, they needed somebody to rule India. Right? And they wanted this private company to do it. And again, it wasn't like they were just completely set free on their own. But you know, it, was, it wasn't, uh, they were hoping that they could fund themselves uh, by, by taxing and things like that. This thing was going bankrupt, so they came up with a scheme to funnel money to the East India Company and also uh, tax the colonists, and they thought this, this plan would make everybody happy. Okay, the plan was that the tea from India could be brought directly to the colonies. Before this point, anything going to the colonies had to go through England, unload off of the ships into a, into a warehouse, and then from that warehouse onto another merchant ship going directly to the colonies. All that designed to force business through England. That's where a lot of the colonists just completely ignored it and, and shipped it straight to the colonists, and, and you know, part of the tension was trying to enforce those laws seriously. But here, this tea tax, it allowed them to ship the tea directly there, but then put a tax on it, and the tax was less than the extra expense of going to England and coming across the ocean again. So this tea actually was cheaper than the stuff that wasn't taxed before that had to go through England, if that makes sense. Does that make some sense? Okay, so, so this, the, the actual end cost to the consumer was lower, even though it was still taxed. And England thought this is, everybody wins. <laughs> The East India Company has this large market to sell tea to, and they make profit on it. We get our tax revenues, so we get our money. The colonists get cheap tea. Everybody's happy. Okay, that, that is what England thought, thought. Parliament, the king, they thought this was going to be a great deal. It ends up uh, completely backfiring in their face. Can anybody think, uh, why? I mean, what's to be upset? Prices are low. I think America today would swallow the hook here. They would take the bait. All right, cheap prices, all right. Uh, cut their food stamps and have riots, but you know. <laughs> what was the problem here? Dickinson in his letters actually warned about this. I at least briefly alluded to that when we got there. 
Yes. Uh, about the parliament not being allowed to tax the income. Yeah, it was still being taxed. Right? We still have parliament having no authority to tax the colonists and still taxing them. Okay, and in a very uh, underhanded way, really. I mean, think of the insult. They, they were assuming the colonists would cave on their principles for cheap tea. You know, imagine somebody came to you and said, hey, uh, um, Miller Lite is less expensive than pop. You want one now? <laughs> you think, well, I don't want pop. I don't want any beer. <laughs> I don't care if it's more expensive. It, it was an insult that they would, I mean, if they came to you and actually thought you would decide to drink the beer because it was cheaper, hopefully you feel insulted that they thought that. Right? And that's the way the colonists took this. This is an insult. You, you really thought we would buy this tea because it's cheaper, even though it's taxed? You thought we would just, this, all, this, all, of us, all this talk about taxation without representation, that really wasn't a big deal. We just didn't, we were upset about the high prices. And that was, there was a very serious insult built into this thing. And the colonists responded, that way. They were very much insulted by this thing. All right, so we have this, this tax being levied and the colonists responding uh, very, very strongly to this because it is still taxed. And we have added on top of that the, the insult that they can be paid off with this lower, tea, a lower price. All right, so a couple of things happen here. Uh, one thing just kind of uh, universally through the colonies is lots of harbors uh, refused to allow the tea to be unloaded. And it, we, Boston is famous because there it gets unloaded into the harbor. Um, <laughs> uh, but lots of places, they refused to allow it to be unloaded. Or in a few places, uh, also Charleston was an example of this. Uh, it got off of the ship and made it to a warehouse, but they never let it leave the warehouse. So they just refused to allow this tea to be brought into the country. There were some rules, um, and I forget offhand exactly how they worked, about a, a, a cargo ship, if it came into harbor and sat there for a certain amount of time, there were some rules about it had to unload or had to leave. It couldn't just hang around forever with this cargo load in it. Um, and that was part of the issue in Boston. It was getting to that deadline, so they had to do something. Either the ship had to be unloaded or the ship had to leave, and so we, there was a deadline coming. So that, there's that issue going on all through the colonies and all the harbors, just the boats, the, they're refusing to allow them to be unloaded. The people that own the warehouse are saying, oh, you know, sorry, mine's all full. You know, I don't know if they got some empty boxes and stacked them up, but it's all full, we can't take anything. Right, so, so we have that uh, taking place all across uh, the coast. All right, then the, the famous thing that takes place here is the Boston Tea Party. It takes place in Boston. Uh, we'd had the same thing here. They refused to allow the ship to be unloaded. It's, um, it's easy to look back at uh, things like this and say, oh yeah, I'd have been there with those guys. That would have been fun. All right. uh, look at knowing that they win. Okay? There's been other times where people did stuff like this and they get caught and hung as traitors. Right? Uh, in Boston, a group of people here led by Samuel Adams, I think you know the story for the most part, dress up like Indians, go down to the harbor at night. There was that, uh, the boats there with the tea in them, um, and it was right at that deadline. Either they had to let them get unloaded or send them back to England, and England was saying they're not leaving harbor without being unloaded. So it was, it was hitting that deadline. So they, they board the ship, throw all the tea overboard through the night, and then they leave and go back home. They, they were very, very careful. Don't, this was not a wild, angry mob, all right? Uh, they didn't kill the crew. They didn't hurt the crew. They did um, just kind of very nicely say, if you guys don't fight, we're not going to hurt you. Right? Just stay out of the way. Uh, they threw all the tea over. They didn't ransack the ship. They didn't go through the captain's quarters and still stuff. They threw the ship, the tea over. They even replaced the lock that they had to bust uh, to get into the into the stuff. So don't don't think of this as a wild uh, group of people. They might have been wild, but they, they were wanting to throw the tea in the harbor. That was it. All right. So they pitched the tea in the harbor uh, there in uh, in Boston. Now this is the part where it's it's easy to look back and say, of course I would have been with them. But it's it's a major step to sit around in class or for these guys in a tavern or actually they met in a church before they went down there. Uh, sit around and. Uh, 
talk about, yeah, let's go do something to, all right, let's go do it now. <laughs> and it's, it's a big difference to go from talking about it to going to do it. You guys might sit in the dorm and say, oh, somebody's got to get Matthew. We, we need to throw him in the lake. You know, it's easy to talk, but at some point, to actually throw him in is a different story. Right? And to actually be part of that, it's, it's easy to talk is the point. And here these guys took that next step and they actually got involved. Another place that I, I especially respect the guys there was at, um, at Lexington, uh, the, you know, the, the, where the, the first shots were fired. Uh, those guys, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we need to fight the British, to, okay, I'm going to go stand in the field and let them shoot at me. <laughs> That's a big step. All right, so here, we, these guys uh, doing this, it was not a small thing. It's easy to look back and say, oh, it would have been fun, a little prank at night. Uh, no, not so much. So. All right, so we have the colonists here responding to this, this, this thing very strongly, and I think justifiably uh, angry at this insult, uh, as, as well as the tax. And the, the last point I have here for this tea tax is that Parliament didn't back down. Prior to this, they passed a law, and there was the reaction and the colonists, and they would back off. Usually they would leave some symbolic thing there to say, you know, we still think we can tax you, but, you know, we don't want the fight. Here, they did not. Parliament, the king, they buckle on, or they, they just determined the colonies are going to submit. All right, so we, we have ourselves on a collision course even stronger. So, all right, one little side note. Um, America's uh, beverage of choice changes at this point. We have some in the office today. Pastor Damon bought it for all the staff. Coffee, all right, it really does. The, the, we still wanted to drink something, right? so we, we quit drinking the tea and switched to coffee. So Starbucks is a direct result. And that's just sad because they're such a pagan, <coughs> liberal organization. <laughs> So, all right, but really, I'm not joking about the coffee. We really did begin drinking coffee as a, as a group at this point. All right, so now we have England determined to force the colonies to buckle under. You know, they're, they're not going to back up. And we get a wave of legislation from Parliament here in the next year. This tea tax and the tea party, all that was in 73. The next year, we get a wave of legislation passed through Parliament uh, aimed at doing that, or at least taking steps towards forcing the colonists to buckle under. These things are collectively called the Intolerable Acts by Americans, I was to say by us, but Americans. Um, England called them the Coercive Acts. They were, you know, designed to coerce the colonies into subjection, to help them realize that they should listen. We call them the Intolerable Acts. These come through Parliament in the spring of 74, uh, end of March through the first parts of June. We get these passed through Parliament. And I want to run down through these, um, these laws quickly. We've got four more pages, but some of the pages are short, so we, we can do this. All right, here's the intolerable acts. The first one is the Boston Port Bill. All right, this simply sh closed the port of Boston until the East India Company was repaid. Nothing in, nothing out, until the East India Company was paid back for the tea that was lost. Simply, I mean, that's simple to say. Kind of like last night, you know, being part of a family is a simple thing, but you know, actually being born into the family is difficult. Simple, simple idea, close the port of Boston. To accomplish this, uh, there was a military force that was sent. Four regiments under a man named General Gage, you might have heard that name before, was sent to occupy the port and to make sure nothing went in, nothing went out, until the East India Company was repaid. All right, uh, the next one, the Administration of Justice Act. They were good, too, at, at naming things that really didn't fit, like the Affordable Care Act, um, Uh, there was one, what is the one about um, campaign finance reform? That law, uh, Rush Limbaugh always calls it the Incumbent Protection Act because it put restrictions on how much you could spend in a race, which gave the incumbent, whose name is already well known, 
a significant advantage. So anyway, so, so just like us today, they're good at naming these things uh, something that is completely not what it is, is. Administration of Justice Act. What this thing did was it allowed any Brit British official who was accused of a crime in the colonies to be tried back in England rather than stand trial in the colonies where they were accused of something, whether or not they were guilty is another issue, accused of something, they'd be tried in England. Can anybody think, um, think about this and tell me? What do you think? Yeah, much more lenient, right? So it was, uh, it, uh, you know, be like saying, you know, anybody accused of police brutality in Chicago is going to be tried by a jury of police officers or something. <laughs> we can't get a fair trial. And I, I think the police brutality is, was blown overboard, you know, made, made a bigger deal than it is. But you're not going to get a fair trial is the point, okay? There's another complicating issue. Uh, if you have somebody, some British official, you know, burn your barn down or something, you're trying to... Uh, prosecute them, and the trial's in England. Can you, can you do a Skype appearance at the trial to testify? <laughs> You've got to go to England. I mean, this is, uh, beyond the fact that it's not going to be a fair trial, this is an incredibly large burden. You've got you to travel there to testify. You've got to get your witnesses there to testify. It's very difficult, even if the trial was going to be fair, to have the trial. All right, so the Administration of Justice Act. Yep. And what year was that? All of these are in 74. Spring of 74. All right, the next one is the Massachusetts Government Act. It might be more accurately called the Massachusetts Non-Government Act because it stripped away the, the government of Massachusetts. All right, this is the short version of what this thing does, is it limited the power of the colonial government. I'll give you some particular examples that you don't need to, I'm not going to ask you to give me on the test or anything. If you just have limited the power of the colonial government, things that the colonial government had typically been able to do were now stripped out of its hands and put in the power of the king or the governor that the king appointed, <coughs> stripped out of their hands. Here's a couple examples if you want some. Um, there was um, a council that served as an advisory body to the governor that was elected the people of the colony elected people to this thing. The king just started appointing the members to that council. Okay. Uh, the king or the governor appointed the judges rather than them being elected or somehow chosen by the local officials, the king or the governor through the king uh, just appointed them. So things like that, uh, some of their authority and power to govern themselves is being stripped away, and in most cases in a very unfair fashion, a fashion that's going to give the king and the, the government all the advantages here. Okay, so the Massachusetts Government Act, the, the authority, the power of the colonial government being stripped away. All right, the next one is the Quartering Act. The Quartering Act. Uh, this had to do with quartering soldiers. And we've seen this already before, but this one got even more intrusive. Before, basically, it was... Uh, you know, Virginia, here's your 2,000 troops. Keep them healthy and fat and happy and warm and sheltered, and we'll get them in the spring. You know, that, that type of thing. This one was much, much more intrusive where, where the, the, the soldiers and, you know, the, their officers and whatnot could arrange, and you wouldn't have a choice but to house them if you had a, a spare room or a, a barn. Uh, they would put them there. <laughs> And you were, you were supposed to help take care of them. So we have much more intrusive here uh, cordon of soldiers. It wasn't just something that the government had to figure out where to put them. It, it allowed the soldiers through their officers to be put into much more private places. Okay, so the quartering act. The same thing we saw before, but much, much more personal now. All right, one more act here to look at. Um, on a technical note, this is not part of the coercive acts. It was, in the minds of the British, looked at as a separate issue. In the minds of the colonists, it really wasn't, uh, and I think you'll see why. So I have it thrown in here with the Intolerable Acts. It's passed at the, in the same time frame, and it's the Quebec Act. There we go. Did I say that right, Quebec? All right. Uh, Pastor Hilmer from high school, Quebec. <laughs> 
All right, so this is technically not part of the coercive or the intolerable acts, but it fits in this time frame and it fits uh, with the idea, really. Okay, this did a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it extended the territory of Canada all the way to the Ohio River. Caleb's okay, thinking, I like this. <laughs> All right, so all of this was given to Canada. Now, why in the world would England give away land to Canada? Yeah, Canada was part of England. It was an English colony. So they were, they were giving this land to another English colony. Okay. Anybody remember, can think of how the colonists might react to this? Pretty much any time you say hey, they don't like it, that's a pretty safe answer. But why wouldn't they like this? Yeah, the same, the same reasons why they were upset with this proclamation line. Now it's being given completely away to another colony. All right, so we have that issue. And then the other issue, well, I guess I should say there's three things really. Uh, the third thing is it established Catholicism as the major religion. Now I've always had a question, I don't know if you know of how extensive that was. Do you have any idea how extensive the, the enforcing Catholicism on Canada was? Okay, I don't know if it's something where you just had to pay it. <coughs> you had to pay taxes to the church or you had to be part of the church to vote. I don't know how extensive it was, so, okay. You're no help. You can just make fun of my French pronunciations, <laughs> which is a valid mocking. All right, so established Catholicism there is a dominant religion. And then the, the, um, the third point is another one that I don't really expect Kevin to know the answer to. It, uh, it made the government less democratic. And I, again, I don't know exactly how that worked. But, but the people voting less, more just the, the rulers being selected by the king. And I, I don't know the, the particulars of how that worked out. All right, why would this upset the colonists? Stephanie knows all the answers, but she loves to share. Others are thinking it's much more blessed to give than to receive, and I don't want to receive what she's offering me. <laughs> yes? The, uh, well, they would want the right to vote, and if that was just taken away. And that was really a very serious part of it. If, if King, England has the authority to do this in Canada, what's to stop them from coming here and doing the same thing? All right, really, that was, that's half of it. Um, the, the fear of England claiming this authority, and there's nothing to go for them from going to Virginia. An Anglican established church and said, oh, you know what, you guys need to be Catholic. <laughs> there's nothing to stop that, nothing to stop them continuing to strip away uh, voting rights and that type of thing. So there was that, that fear <coughs> there. All right, uh, another fear. Let me see if I can find it quick. I should look this up. This is from the Declaration of Independence. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, Canada, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. Right? The fear of, <clears throat> by expanding the boundaries here, uh, they were making it much easier for England to invade and attack the colonies from all this, this new land that they were stripping away from the colonies. So making it a fit instrument uh, to force this type of same arbitrary rule. So we have one facet, you know, they don't have the right to do this and they could just claim they have the right here. And the other facet was uh, they're going to, this is going to make it easier for England to invade the colonies as if this is left like this. Okay, so, so kind of two thoughts there that uh, go with the Quebec. I think you can see why it fits here with the intolerable acts, even though it was not officially part of them. All right, questions about the Quebec Act or any of the intolerable acts? All right, what we've seen is the colonies uh, resist, England back down, back down, and now they say, okay, we're done backing down. Do we see the colonists just give up at this point? I'm just checking to see if anybody's awake. Okay. The colonists win. They, they don't submit to England. So we, 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 we see tensions continue to rise here and the issue become more serious. All right, let's uh, go on. And that was the Intolerable Acts, 74. The next thing we have is the First and Second Continental Congress. 
the first and second Continental Congress. <clears throat> All right, uh, my outline here is very, very um, extensive. I have the first Continental Congress as the first point. And then the second main point is the Second Continental Congress. So, all right, First Continental Congress. This meeting was called for um, by Massachusetts. You know, they were the ones under the, the, the thumb screws here of England, most primarily. So they called for this meeting uh, of delegates from all of the colonies to meet in Philadelphia. Boston wasn't very convenient at that point. So they meet in Philadelphia. And they begin to meet there on September the 5th of 1774. It was the spring time of that year that we have the Intolerable Acts passed. So through the summer and then September the 5th, uh, these guys uh, began to meet there at this first Continental Congress, a meeting of delegates from all of the colonies. Initially, everybody but Georgia, but in time, all of the colonies uh, get on board here. Let me just mention a few things they do in this initial meeting and then... Uh, some things happen, and then they have a second Continental Congress about to talk about. So in this initial, initial meeting, a couple things happen. First of all, they did not meet to declare independence. That was not, there were people calling for that, uh, but that was not the primary thought of let's all get together to figure out how we can not only declare independence, but actually maintain it. Uh, that was not it. All right. They, they were, were wanting to collectively respond here to what England is doing. Right. <clears throat> We have Massachusetts and Boston really under, this, under the, the guns here of England with the port and the government being stripped away. Um, and they were wanting to respond as a group rather than let Boston stand by itself and possibly succumb. They wanted to stand as a group. We saw that idea earlier um, with the French and Indian War that was shot down, but that idea is still there, and it brings, comes up here. So this was that effort, them coming to work together to try to address what's <laughs> happened with England, not at this point declare independence, just, just trying to come to some sort of understanding that you guys are overstepping uh, the legitimate bounds of government. Okay, uh, they do, beyond that general intent, <clears throat> they actually do one thing, they set up a boycott of goods from England. We'd seen this type of thing before, but mostly it was individual states or, you know, or colonies at this point or ports. This was uh, <clears throat> a um, colony-wide effort here to refuse to allow things in from England. Again, trying to put pressure on the merchants of England. I mean, that was a, a major source of income for lots of Englishmen, so trying to put pressure on them. This does not work. All right, but uh, there was that attempt that made. Um, there was actually a lot of hope by these delegates. They were saying, you know what, surely the king is going to understand. And we'll, we'll set up this boycott. We'll you know, write him a nice letter. Surely he'll understand, but it does not. George III actually responds to this. He didn't actually go to the Congress and tell them this, but this was his comment in England. He said, the die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. I do not wish to come to severe measures, but we must not retreat. All right, so you can see uh, his resolve there. We're not backing up. We're not giving in. We're not, uh, we're not going to give in. So. All right, so that was uh, the fall there, September of so 1774. These delegates meet. They uh, organize this boycott, send off this nice letter to the king, and the king responds. I mean, re just completely rejects this out of hand, not even, not even listening to it. Uh, they decided when they left that they would meet back in the spring if it was needed. And between those two meetings, something of significant happens that we need to talk about. I have this underneath the First Continental Congress, just to have some place to put it in my notes. And it's the battles of Lexington and Concord. All right, the, those, those take place between the two meetings. So it's fall time of 74 that we have the meeting, they disband, go home. And then in the spring before they meet, we have Lexington and Concord. All right, so what happens here at Lexington and Concord? These are two cities, two small towns just outside of Boston. We should take a field trip. In my world history class before this one, there's every class period, there's three or four places we need to go visit. It needs to be like a two-year world travel thing for world history. So. We'd have to raise tuition significantly, but I think it'd be worth it. So, because you know, obviously I can't 
I wouldn't have to pay for myself. The students would pay for me. And, uh, <laughs> what's that? Around the world in 80 days. Oh, no, we need more than 80 days to really enjoy it. So. All right, uh, Lexington and Concord were two city, two towns outside of Boston. And uh, I'm sorry, guys, don't let me, they all know the name, so don't let me leave you in the dark. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Two towns, and it was places where the, the Massachusettsans, I don't know, the, the people of Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, were gathering weapons, right? You know, tensions are building. Boston is basically, or not basically, is occupied by this point to shut down the port and the harbor and all of that. Uh, so they began to, the, to amass weapons, stockpile of arms. And uh, General Gage here sends out a detachment of troops to capture this stockpile of arms. He hoped to, um, as an extra bonus, um, pick up Samuel Adams and John Hancock along the way and catching them unawares. But the, the primary thing was the stockpile of arms. All right, then I think we are familiar maybe with the, the famous ride of Paul Revere. All right, he, uh, I, I'm going to back up. I, I remember as a student thinking, what's the big deal? You get on a horse and you ride through the countryside. What? <laughs> This is occupied by the British military, that Boston is. He has to get out of there and ride through the countryside to warn the people that the British are coming. The British, they did not want this to happen. They had sentries out. They had people out uh, trying to prevent any word getting out that they, were, that they were coming. So this is not just a nice, friendly uh, romp through the woods at night. Right? He was dodging British soldiers. And there, um, there was a real, real chance of capture or death here. So this is uh, not a small thing. So anyway, he takes off, another guy, William Dawes, take off. They warn the countryside that the British are marching. <clears throat> the, the first place the British come to of significance is Lexington. This is on April the 19th, 1775. And here are 77 Americans stand in the, uh, at the, in the village green there. I mean, just, again, imagine me in here saying, all right, let's go fight the... Uh, uh, the Muslims, and so there's, there's uh, several thousand of them uh, coming up by the guy's dorm. Let's go meet them in the field out there. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, you can't shoot anyway. The Muslims? Or the <laughs> they have their knives, the dull knives that they're going to cut your head off with. <laughs> uh, but anyway, th these guys, they actually go out and they stand in the field. The British march in, command them to, to disperse. They don't, and then the British fire on them. Uh, let's see here. There's eight killed, ten wounded. And this initial, it was, it, it's not a battle. I mean, really, there, there's some shots back and forth, and then the, the 77 dispersed. I mean, they're, they're way outnumbered. This was, they, they, this was uh, they were, um, at some point, you've got to stand and say, no, you're not coming by. And the, the British decided to fire at that point. All right, so that was April the 19th. If you've heard the phrase, the shot heard round the world. That's referring to, to this, this engagement. The American uh, commander, I just forgot his name. Those on the team trip would have been there. Parker? Parker? And there's a phrase that I'll butcher. We don't know if he said it, but it sounds really good. If the British mean to have a war, let it start here something to that effect. You know, well, if, if they want to fight, let them shoot at me first. Right? So anyway, brave group of men here. They, they stand, uh, British fire on them, they disband. Uh, not a contest. Don't think of this as this really hard fought thing. They march to the city, go on to Concord, uh, destroy what they can there, the stockpile that was left, and then start heading back. And it's on this trip back that things really go ugly for the British. On the way back, the whole countryside who's been riled up by this, by this point now, it's later in the day. Uh, stories are traveling like wildfire through the countryside. You think news travels past on Facebook, you know, have a bunch of people angry that, you know, their neighbor just got shot in Lexington. Let that news spread. All right, so the news is spreading like wildfire. So all of the, uh, all of the local farmers come out here to, to uh, shoot at the British as they go back to Boston. And we have on the way back 273 British being killed, <laughs> getting back to Boston. 273. There were 93 Americans killed total, about 
2,000 or so was the estimation of the number of Americans that actually show up to, to, to shoot at them. But this is all the local farmers, uh, the Minutemen, others. I mean, to say local farmers isn't uh, accurate, uh, it doesn't give the right impression. These guys, uh, they were used to training and drilling for the military. I mean, they, 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 they were used to taking on their own defense especially in the frontier regions, they, they had to maintain defenses against the Indians. So it wasn't like they, they weren't used to military things, but it, this wasn't the paid military of Massachusetts. This was the local farmers. Uh, they come out and they, they open fire on the British and uh, a lot of them get killed, uh, but they just harass them all the way back uh, to Boston. All right, so that's the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the first battle, if you want to call it that, of the war. April the 19th, 1775. Okay, so that happens in between. We have uh, the First Continental Congress meeting, setting up this boycott, hoping the king will listen, and then obviously here, uh, he's not listening. <laughs> and that leads us to the Second Continental Congress. This one begins to meet on May the 10th of 1775, about a, less than a month after Lexington and Concord. Uh, we see them meeting. And there's even more amazing um, so amazing extent here to how far they were willing to go to have peace. Now I've got to quit getting bogged down. This is the wrong part to hurry through because there's so much good stuff to talk about. So I might have to kill a few questions on the test. All right, they begin to meet on May the 10th, 1775 in Philadelphia. They do a couple of things of significance. Uh, first of all, they send another petition to the king. I mean, we've had the, the British in Boston openly march and fire on the citizens of Boston, all right? The, 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 the Massachusetts, they didn't initiate this thing. The England launched the attack on them. And they still send this petition. It's called the Olive Branch Petition. It, was, it, was, um, it wasn't something harsh and nasty. There was a legitimate effort here to make peace. They, they weren't expecting a peaceful result, but they, they didn't make that effort. So they send this petition to the king. Um, all right, after that, they began to form an army. All right, like I said, they, they weren't overly optimistic, so they began to form an army. Uh, a relatively obscure figure from American history is placed in charge of it. George Washington is placed in charge of it. He is the father of our country, and that, that is the, I mean, without him, uh, things would have gone very, very differently. Very important man. All right, he's placed in charge of the army which is, uh, you know, it'd be like uh, Congress coming to Jacob and saying, all right, you're in charge of uh, defending the southern border. Uh, here's a rifle. <laughs> there wasn't an army. I mean, he had to organize this thing. He had to help recruit troops. He had to put this thing together. All right, so uh, it don't, it, sometimes you have this vision of this army that's just kind of standing there inert, and you just put a commander in front of him, and all the guys pop to life, and they march behind him. There was no army, all right? <laughs> he had to put this thing together, all right? So they began to form that thing, put Washington in charge. Uh, they also uh, issue what's called the Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms. This is the Continental Congress that puts this thing out. It's called the, i uh, butcher it, Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms. They really got to shorten that, you know, the Affordable Care Act, uh, this is way too long. It does just what it sounds like, though. <laughs> it was an official statement by the Continental Congress explaining why they're taking up arms. Why are, they, why are they organizing an army to fight against England? They send off this petition to the king trying to make peace, and now they're organizing military units to fight. Why are they doing this? Okay, and it's, that's all it was, them explaining to the world, anybody that wants to listen, why? They eventually do the same type of thing with the Declaration of Independence. They explain to the world, and anybody that wants to listen, why they are separating from England. But here, at this point, just explain why they're taking up arms, not, not claiming or wanting to be separated at, yet. Okay, and then the last thing for this Second Continental Congress is that they continue to meet through the war. All right? When you hear about Congress during the war, this is the body that they're talking about. The, the people at it shift, the new representatives come. Um, but this body had no authority. There was no constitution that said they could do certain things. So it was, a, they, they, it was really just ever how much the states or the colonies wanted to cooperate with them were they able to get things done. But this, whatever government structure we had, this was it uh, through, the colony, through the war. 
All right, Second Continental Congress. That's at least here. We've got to talk about Boston. Yeah, one more page. We can do this. Battle for Boston. All right, swirling still behind all of this is Boston still occupied. The British military has occupied Boston. It's under, you know, guard. There's sentries around it. You're not free to come and go. It's occupied by, by the British. Has been for a while now. All right, and we're going to see that change before independence. All right, it, it takes place before the Declaration of Independence. All right, the first thing to mention actually doesn't take place right around Boston, but it's Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys up here. Uh, they take a place called Fort Ticonderoga. <clears throat> if you ever want to read about an interesting group of people, uh, read about the Green Mountain Boys. Anybody read much about them? They were, this, this land was wasn't part of any colony officially. And I, I think they're from, I think it was New York and, and New Hampshire that both claimed this area, and I forget which colony they were from, but they were from one of the colonies. And the reason they organized was to drive out the other people. <laughs> if somebody from New Hampshire came and started to build a house, they would uh, scare them off, you know, burn their barn down, <laughs> that type of vigilante activity. And that, that group now uh, goes up to take Fort Ticonderoga, a British fort. They capture the fort, not a fight, surprise them completely. And the important part of it is the cannons get brought down to Boston. And that really makes the difference in Boston. They don't get there right away, but they get brought down to Boston. Uh, that was on uh, May the 10th of 1775, the same day that the Second Continental Congress, I'm sorry, yeah, the Second Continental Congress began to meet. It had been just after Lexington and Concord. They would have heard, you know, the fight's already engaged. There's a British fort right here. You know, <laughs> let's do our part. So anyway, they take this fort. Uh, the commander uh, of, of the uh, Ethan Allen, the, the commander of these guys, when he commanded the, the fort to surrender, the guy said, in whose name? And he said, in the name of the great Jehovah and of the Continental Congress. That was who the, they were commanded to surrender to. So anyway, a very flamboyant, interesting group of people. So, um, Benedict Arnold was, was, uh, was amongst them there as well. All right, cannons get brought down to Boston. That, that is the important thing. They show up in a little bit in Boston. Now let's go to Boston. All right, George Washington brings the Continental Army to Boston. It might not be accurate to describe it as a Continental Army, but he brings whatever it is up to Boston, and they begin to uh, put up defensive barriers around Boston, things to try to hold the British in. I don't have time to read you this full quote. Um, I'll be part of it. This is Boston, Washington describing Boston and what's going on right now, describing his army. He said, the, re the reflection on my situation and that of this army produces many an unhappy hour when all around me are wrapped in sleep. Few people know the predicament we are in on a thousand accounts. <clears throat> Fewer still will believe if any disaster happens from what cause it flows. Um, if we're able to, I'm skipping a little bit, if we're able to rise superior to these difficulties and many others, which might not be enumerated, I shall most religious, religiously believe uh, that the finger of God is in it to blind the eyes of her enemies. For surely, if you get well past this month, it must be for want of their knowing the disadvantages which we labor under. He's saying the, the British in, Washington, in Boston don't know how bad off we are, or they would just come out here and kill us. Right? And he's saying if they don't figure that out, it is going to be because of providence. God, he's saying. It'll be God that protects us. So anyway, they, they come up there, don't think of this well-organized military unit. They're, they're just putting this together and begin to put up defensive barriers. All right, uh, they're around Boston. The British then, uh, in, the, in the spring of 1775, or actually midsummer now, on July the 17th, uh, they attack part of this line, a uh, place called Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. The, the Americans, there were hills just outside the town overlooking the harbor. The American forces had set up uh, little defensive uh, mechanisms up there, you know, walls and whatnot. And the British come and attack them. The British really thought they would just roll over top of them. Um, the British did. They did drive them off the hill. But the British had 1,054 casualties to drive them off the hill. The Americans had 100 as well as some wounded 
All right, so this is a very, very painful victory uh, for them. The British thought that they wouldn't stand. It would be a, 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 an intimidating sight to see a, you know, several thousand redcoats in lines marching and the drums playing and you could see the gleam off of the bayonets that you know if they get to you, it's, it's, it's coming through you. It's, you know, it's not somebody else that you say, you go up there and be brave. <laughs> it's you. And for these guys to stand there and, uh, and drove them off. Anyway, fight them uh, as well as they can. They do get pushed off. Uh, the British three times uh, launch assaults on this fortification and the third time take it. All right, so that was July the 17th, 1775. The British drive them off of Boston. The, 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 the American forces are still there, so it's not like they, they routed them. Uh, they just got driven off of that hill. A couple of things happen um, right during this time from England as well that I want to slide in here, and uh, then we'll, we'll get Boston wrapped up and have a minute or two to talk about our test. All right, two things happen from Parliament. The first is on August the 23rd, still 1775, something called the Proclamation of Rebellion. It's just what it sounds like. England declared the colonies were an open rebellion. And then the other one comes along in December, the Prohibitory Act. Okay, so all through this fall, we have the, the American forces outside Boston, the British inside of Boston, neither able neither really challenging the other's position at this point, but still there all this time. The prohibitory act. This did two things. It prohibited trade with the colonies. Nobody's allowed to bring goods in. <clears throat> and the others removed Brit British protection from colonial shipping. So if, uh, you know, supposedly the colonists are still part of the British Empire, but if they were down in uh, the Caribbean and some pirates attacked their ship, the British aren't going to come and help. You're on your own, pushing them out of out of their protection. So, okay, so that happens in December. All right, then the next spring, uh, we get this battle for Boston wrapped up. Uh, it was uh, March of 1776. Those cannons from Ticonderoga show up on those hills around Boston, literally overnight. And the, the, the British go to sleep, and the next morning there's cannons placed up there. And Instantly, the British knew they could not hold Boston. The cannons could just, just pummel them, destroy their ships, and everything. Now, the Americans did not open fire immediately. Can anybody think why they didn't open fire just instantly? It was Boston. It was, it was their own people down there. They want, didn't want to kill them, or they didn't have to. But the British knew they could not hold it. So once those cannons show up, the British evacuate and leave Boston. And uh, we have the American forces occupying it, or them, them being freed, really. All right, last thing to mention, uh, this also, well, I should have had it, oh well, takes place just before the uh, cannon showing up at Boston. It's the pamphlet written by Thomas Paine called Common Sense. This thing is published on January the 10th of 1776 and spreads like wildfire. Uh, 120,000 copies are sold in three months, which if you think of the printing technology, that's a decent number. It, it spreads very quickly uh, through the colonies. And all it stated basically was that it was common sense for the colonists to separate from England. It's, it's time. You, there's been enough. Thomas Paine, isn't, Thomas Paine isn't really somebody to look up to and admire. He, he goes haywire later in life. But his pamphlet here did have a major effect, solidifying a lot of the, the colonists' thinking that, okay, it's time. We've tried, we've tried, we've tried. It's time. So, all right, and if you're watching the dates, we're March of 1776. All right, so the next main event is the uh, Declaration of Independence, July the 4th of that year. But that's what I'd like to I'd like to pick up with that um, after our test.